On today's episode, we're going to try to answer to a very simple question. What it takes in 2019 to build a carbon frame mountain bike 100% made in Europe. Nowadays, the vast majority of mountain bikes is made overseas, especially if they are carbon frame mountain bikes. We are in Barcelona, Spain, and we're gonna meet a guy who is challenging the mountain bike industry, producing one of the most exclusive mountain bike available today. Let's go check it out. So we are going to meet Cesar Rojo, the man behind Uno Bike. Hi, see, sir. Hey, how are good you? to see you. How are you? Oh, yeah. Doing thank, good? thank you very much for having us today. So very My excited pleasure. about that. Yeah. As a bike designer, did the, your racing experience brought something to your like work, your mentality? Oh, for sure. I think you know, in, in racing, you learn definitely discipline and things, and how important it is to to be comfortable with your bike. That doesn't mean that you set up it's amazing, but to be comfortable with the bike straight away. And I think every time we design a bike, we really try that. We really try to make bikes that they're comfortable, they're easy to get along with. So, and, and this, oh, for instance, when we did the first um, downhill bike for Mondraker and with Fabian, you know, he, he, we were talking and he was saying like with the, with the Kona, he had a lot of issues to get comfortable on the bike so he could like from time to time really push for a race like for the world champs or something like this he will like focus on a setup for that race for uh, for the, for one time and get one run perfect but on a normal basis for him was very very difficult to get good results because one day he will feel super good on the bike and the other day not so good and with the Mondrager what he said is like well I, this bike lets me go fast everywhere I think that comes from the racing side to understand a bit what's needed uh, and what a customer could need because yeah. the typical question is like, ah, you might build something to only go fast. But in the end, uh, to me, what I say, it's, it's always the same. It doesn't matter if you go fast or slow. It, going fast is relative because what is it fast? Is it fast my pace or is it uh, Aaron's win or, or Luke Bruni's pace? Because it's like same difference as me to another guy yeah. and same to that guy to another one. So it's fast or like super fast or mega fast or whatever. So, but still it's the same issue, like with different setups, so harder setup, whatever, but still, you know, if a bike has problems have being comfortable in the front end because it slides too much or whatever reason, you know, I'm pretty sure Luke Bruni have the same issue. I will have the same issue and another average guy will have the same issue. Just at different speeds, but the feeling is going to be the same. See, Zero Design is the motor company. I would say they're, they're two separate companies. Oh, two separate companies. Yeah, it's just Thero, it's what I started initially and it's where we do all the, we do engineering and... and so you're not so doing, that's the point, you're not doing just mountain bikes, so with Thero you do... Yeah, we're doing many things, so it's not, we, we have a couple mountain bike customers, but it's, it's I would say, 20% of our business, if not less. Okay. So we're doing many, many things on, on with Thero, so... Um, Which is mainly motorcycle? Cars. Yeah, but now a lot of com carbon fiber projects. So different industries, like from electronics to, to automotive to, yeah, many, many industries. So, you know, and then we do, we work for heavy machinery companies. We work for um, components, different types of components, electronics, like I said, the bicycle industry, motorcycle. So it's, it's quite broad now. We have very different types of projects. So Uno, you start that just purely based on passion or what? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, if I wouldn't have started basically because one of the biggest points is the passion, I would probably did it differently. I would do it easily, I would say. That it's, you know, you go to Asia, you get a manufacturer there because the way we started is the hard way, the hardest way possible, trying to make everything ourselves. So I really believe in, in what we're doing. It's, um, it's a long process, so it's the hard way, you know, it's like, you know, the, the original Yeti guys, intense, specialized, started in, in the 80s uh, or even earlier, some of them. 
So it's the way they started at home pretty much. So home here is a decent studio and all that, but it's the same, same story. Like the, the, the very first frames, I laid, laid them up myself. So I was putting the carbon there. I was doing it in the afternoons after we finished our work here. So, you know, it felt a bit like the old the school old, the, the, okay. startup where, but with a, with where you do it in the with afternoon. different stuff because they, yeah. were, they, they were doing steel, steel and, and then alloy. Yeah. You're doing carbon. Yeah. But you it, completely skip the... Yeah, we skip a couple yeah, years exactly. in between the technologies yeah. and, exactly. and a couple bicycle because, standards too. <laughs> because that's what most of the time people say is how you can really start a company which is based on the idea to produce high-end carbon mountain bike frames 100% made in Europe, 100% made in Barcelona. Yeah. I don't know, this maybe comes from my racing background where, you know, I kind of like things difficult and fight for them and, and, and all that. But, but to me, honestly, one of the, the things was, was, okay, if we go to Asia, we can have a really cool design, we can have all this, all that, but in the end, you're gonna be another brand in an ocean of brands because what else you can offer or, or what else you can build on the name of your brand because you know when you when you think about intense when you think about yeti when you think about all these brands they have a, a past either because they were the first ones or because they did an iconic downhill bike and, and you know and or, or whatever it's different each bike had each brand had his thing but I feel also like, okay, let's, if we start something, it needs to be hard. Or I don't know how to, how to express it. You mentioned a couple of times the hard way. So yeah. can you actually I tell us a, a little bit more about this hard way, which is the process? Yeah. Uh, I will correct that and say the very hard way. The very hard way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's been very tough. Like, so to explain it easy, when, when you go to Asia, basically you get some engineers, whatever, do a design, the exterior surfacing, and you just go to Asia, fly there, find your factory and say, hey, I want to build this. They give you some feedback, okay, you modify two or three small things because for a manufacturing process, we need that. We give him, you give the, the factory, or the vendor, the requirements you want for your frame. So I, I want to achieve in between this range of parameters because they cannot do that much, so they are like pretty tight. So this range of parameters of stiffness or, or something like this and this strength. Between also their limits. If you want to go over this, then they, they might say, okay, if you want something really, I don't know, strong for whatever reason or very or super, super lightweight, you might need to go to a very specialized um, supplier. But if you want something normal, this, you tell them what you want and then it's a matter of paying. And that's it, it's like, okay, the molds are gonna cost you this, and each frame is gonna cost you this. And there you go. So- You're talking about big numbers. No, 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 yeah. no, they're, 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 the, the numbers, they're not so big. Anyway, I mean, you, you can, there's, there's good vendors. Good vendors, they start off 100 bikes. Okay. Per order, but you can make one order a year. So, so you don't need to make a huge brand. The investment is big because you will be talking to start in between 70 to 100,000 per bike and sizes. But still, anyway, it's going to cost you almost the same if you do one size or all the sizes. So for them, it's, you know, it's also a way to make sure they get some upfront money as well. But once you, you overcome this, it's, it's in terms of, of product, it's done. It's just a matter of, okay, selling. You don't need to worry about, I mean, you do on, uh, the arts for the bikes and all this, but you don't need to worry about looking for suppliers for your graphics. You need to worry about looking for a supplier for your box, whatever. They do everything. You just say, oh, put my logo in a box, whatever, and the bike's sent to you with the shock assembled or however you want it. Super easy. In here, we had to learn everything, like everything. So starting from where do I buy a carbon fiber oven? Like, it's not that you open, you know, internet. <laughs> I mean, of course, you, nowadays we like you have Google and, you know, but you need to spend certain hours asking, checking, okay, this is the right oven for us. How much is the price? How long is it gonna take? And, you know, four months, okay, four months. Let's wait four months until the first oven arrives. You know, it goes like this. So you start with the, with the oven, but then, the carbon fiber itself, the, the fiber. 
So, okay, I need pre-prec, let me see who we have. Okay, we have these guys in the UK, these guys in Italy, let's order this. We start with the T700 because we know it's the standard and, and take it from there. This is just the basics. Then it's making the molds. You've never done molds for carbon fiber before, so we need to figure out the process. Now, you know, as the company has grown, we have now guys that come from, from doing molds in the carbon industry, they come from plastic, so they know all that now. But when we were smaller and we started, we had no, no idea. Had to figure ourselves and like, oh, we screw it and do the mold again. And, you know, it was every single step that you could imagine, every single thing, we had to do it three or four times. But on the other hand, we've learned so much because it's not that, that we copy the process, it's not that, um, of course, it's very similar to the proce process used in Asia, but we had to relearn it ourselves. So we know the reason of each thing, we know how to improve things, we know how they make mistakes. Well, in there, I feel, you know, each factory has copied what other factories do, and sometimes um, they're not so sure what they're doing certain things. It's just because, yeah, this guy we hired from someone else or we paid this and he told us to do it this way. It's been tough, really nice, but it's, it's a very frustrating process that, um, yeah. I, oh. I won't do it again. Really? If I had to restart and I, if I knew what was gonna come after, I would probably not do it, at least not this way. I would maybe do one bike and with time, and then do the first ones in, in Taiwan or whatever, in China, in Vietnam, whatever they manufacture. But um, it's, it's, really, it's been really, really frustrating and tough and a lot of hours of dedication for something that not so many people appreciate. Do you reckon? I am not so sure if that many appreciate it. I think with time, it's going to be appreciated more and more. Like nowadays, with you know, this globalization, it's killing the planet. So we need to go back to localization. So I think people are realizing more and more that you know, I, some of the guys buy the carbon fiber from Europe, they send it to, to China then that goes back to Europe or goes back to somewhere that's like some, you know, it, it travels too many places and the companies come from here, go to there, go to the other place, you know. And with aluminum, it's worse because most of the aluminum for the bikes there come from Europe. So all the aluminum comes from Europe, goes to China or usually I think normally it's China, the extrusion, they do the tubes, then they weld in either Taiwan or somewhere else or in China as well and then that bike ships back to the US and then it's sold back to Europe or yeah it goes to Europe or whatever so it's but it's still a lot of troubling for for yeah. the all the materials and all that so what you're saying it is it's not just based on performance and passion but there is also let's say an environmental drive behind Hunno yeah for sure it's yeah. a it's a part of an environmental for me it was very important and i think but what I mean is I think that's what it's been going to be more appreciated as well for the customers in the future because, you know, it's, it's what's happening now with plastic, with food, with all this. You're, you're trying to understand and buying local, buying eco, buying certain things. It's a bit more expensive, yeah. but, you know, it's helping other things. So I think when people start realizing, yeah, OK, we buy local, these bikes, but, you know, uh, the footprint is smaller for the planet. And on top of that, the quality, all this, they have this edge. But it's not day and night. It's not that we buy our bikes and for some reason they're 20 times better than bike made in Asia. But they have the details. I think when you see up close one of the bikes, you have the, everyone here is passionate and, and you know, kind of every one of us pretty much supervise every bike that gets out of here. So, and, and the way they, we do the process, it's, it's very well taken care. So, you know, you are not in Asia. To, check the, the polishing process, the painting process. You, you see it, they go, you go there to your factory where your bikes are made, you see it, oh, so cool. But you don't go and talk to the painter and say, hey, next time, can you make sure this line on this model, it gets like this and this other thing takes care of that? No, you might give a bit feedback when you get the first looking samples and that's it. But here, you know, we go down there, we talk to the guy and it's like, you know, I know the name of each guy. You know, so I go to talk to Fede, that's the guy that's painting, and say, oh, 
you know, be careful here. Uh, let's say I don't have any, any tiny bubble or anything anywhere. We don't want anything. So check with the light every single frame after the first paint and take everything out, you know, it has to be perfect. But we had certain principles. We had no pressure from investors or anyone like asking for results straight out. But also, I don't want as well to be one of those brands. And, and you know, if you think of famous downhill racers, I'm not considering one, but, but I kind of relate to maybe where I come from. The, you know, they have Tire Fair, you have Tomac, you have many, they tried to make a bike brand. After two or three years, they got rid of, of tired because, but I think in the end, the main issue is that they didn't bring any any know-how to the brand. They brought the name itself and someone put the money. So after three years, oh, the project's not working. Let's fold it down. I think this is a very different story for me. I think it's a, I mean, I want to be involved personally, want to do really good bikes, but also I've had a company before and I know how to make company work. So, yeah. so um, hopefully, yeah. The, and you're the doing brand. something unique because Uno is definitely, as well, as well. you can either like it or not, but it's yeah. definitely not your average bike. No, I think it's something special or that's how I'd like to see it. And I think that, you know, it's a very good package. I think the bike look, looks good, the bikes ride good. So it's not that you have something pretty, but it rides really bad or, so I think we have a really good package of, of the bike. Plus for some people, like I said, they appreciate that we do everything ourselves. Yeah. I don't know how many of those that appreciate they're willing to pay more for that. Yeah. But for sure, maybe I put it not completely right before, but um, I think a lot of people appreciate, I don't know how many people want to pay for that, something extra for that appreciation. Okay. But it, it honestly, yeah, a lot of people really appreciate what we do here. It's just how many of those are willing to yeah. put that extra for that. Basically, like we start with the, the, some outlines of the geometry and the kinematics. That's how high, I always like to start the, a bike, any bike anyway. Um, so it's very similar, the process is just here, you don't stop and maybe we go more thorough. We spend way, maybe double, three times more time than we do for the brands because of budget issues. Other brands will say, oh, I don't want to pay 200,000 or 300,000 euros to make a frame um, design-wise. So. Um, so anyway, um, we start with the, with the geometry, the kinematics, so we start positioning with the shock, look at the curves. Then depending a bit on, on, on the doubts we have, so it's, it's a new bike, it's based on another one, we try to try something different. We do a very basic mule or a more modular mule to, to try more. Then after that, um, we start sketching. So we put some concepts of things we like other things, whatever, surfaces from cars or buildings or furniture, inspiration basically. So we do this mood board and we try to reflect that in the design. So in Uno that process was, was really long, like we spent quite a lot of time trying to find something different because it's, it's, it's quite hard. So at that moment for us was kind of the seat tower plus the super thin tube tube. And the seat tower after there was a couple bikes with something a bit similar, but still the thin top tube, I think, is something very us. Yeah, that was a, a, a long part of the process. So design sketching and then putting different ideas and solutions. So we work very thorough there, like not only the shape of the frame, but also how we want to route the cable. So we went really, really into detail. After that, it comes engineering. So basically go from the 2D to the 3D and and then is where usually you do some calculations, you do a couple other things, and then just kind of jumps into your supplier. So here is very similar the process. We do it longer, but it's very similar to any bike. But here's where it actually splits. So now it comes the, let's say, fun part, because it's like, okay, now we design the molds for that bike. We make the molds, we do the first. You, made, you make the molds with the CNC that yeah. you have here in-house. Yeah. Okay. We, we then we do the first, um, bikes out of the mold. So usually the first one is just to test, it's like a very thin bike, just to test that the mold is working fine and we, didn't, we you know, everything is adjusted. Then after the first bike, we build one with our base layup that we do in the computer now. So this has changed a lot also through, through the time. Now we do everything on the computer, so we're much, much faster. So then we put that first bike into the testing jigs 
And then there is a matter of, okay, we have a process where we start first with the horizontal loads, then we go to the vertical loads, then we go to the pedaling. So it's just a matter of going steps. So, okay, the first frame passes the first one, breaks at the second. Okay, where, why? Changes, next one. Okay, now we pass two, now we pass. So now it's very easy, I would say, to pass all the tests even with the, with the new um, cross-country full suspension that is going to be the lightest as well, like the hardtail lightest in the world. It's been in this one very easy, but with the hardtail it was really hard to fine-tune that, that layup. I, I think maybe we did 25 to 30 versions really? of the layup to wow. get to the point where we are now. But in, have in mind we started from scratch, like we had no idea. And we started, that was the first bike, we worked on the layup, so we went on the hardest one because the mentality was, okay, if we're able to do the hardest one, then it will be easier to put it on the trail, on the enduro, and on the downhill, because it's kind of taking that idea and upscaling it to reinforce the bike or make it stronger. So that was a bit the way we decided to, to follow the process, and that, that has worked really well, but now has changed a lot. The thing is, what I'm saying now, you know, seems like it could be a year or two, but it was like, Four, four and a half years process until arrive to this final bike that passes all the tests. And then basically, you know, you, you polish, paint, whatever. Um, just the last part of the process that's very, very normal. It's nothing to discover there. But, um, but that was the, the, the thick of it was, was learning that. But, you know, if you think about it, how many years they've been the, doing carbon bikes in, yeah. in Asia. Yeah. How much know-how is there? You know, they, they, their first bikes were, you know, heavier than aluminum and for sure two times heavier than aluminum from nowadays. Yeah. So, but we had to go straight out from no knowledge to, you know, state of the art. And that's what it took so much effort. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, like I said before, I, I wouldn't change it for anything now, but I would. I wouldn't, I would probably end up doing it, but if I have to think about it, like no way, yeah. like, because it has drained a lot of energy from you. Yeah. So it has, if tomorrow I need to start this process again, again, of learning from scratch, I won't do it for sure. I mean, if I would never have done it, then it's a different story. Yeah. But now if I look back, it's like, I don't do it You'll again. You'll never like, know. Yeah. I'd say that. Yeah, no, but this one for sure not. But I mean, I don't think we yeah. will, well, I, I hopefully <laughs> I don't hit my head and forget everything. So. <laughs> And still, uh, probably someone still remembers. So, <laughs> do you actually mem remember the first time you took your Uno bike out for a ride? Ah, yeah, yeah, for yeah? sure. And for sure, uh, it's, it's, it was a super special moment. Like it was in in the there's two special moments. I would say I think the most special was when I took the very very first let's say call it Uno bike for a ride that it was basically an aluminum mule for the dash and I took it from the studio um, and I went through there's a river here up and up to the mountain and, and I remember on that one to like after half of the ride I stop in a place and I just sit down and, and for one hour like looking at the ocean because it was already still was a short way because that was quite early but it was a big milestone um, and another big one was testing for the first time the, the downhill bike they ever, um, the mule as well, the aluminum one, um, but it blew me away. The suspension, we tried something different and still if you see the bike in the World Cup and check the videos, you can really tell there's a big difference on the rear end of that bike and others, like so planted and, and you can really tell on the TV, like it makes a big difference. So. Um, but it blew me away, like the difference. I remember I had a, a Mondraker because, um, yeah, had a, and it was a huge difference in the suspension behavior, and, and that was pretty cool. And, but for sure, I mean, I think the, the, the highest of the highest was the world champs in, in, in Andorra. Yeah. Um, I remember that. Because it was a bit out of nowhere, almost. Like three months before, a friend like, hey, is the world champs here, you should race it. And I was here with the guys. We had no bike in Carbon yet. And he's like, can we make one before the World Champs and I'll race it. Um, so yeah, let's go for it. 
No way. So three months before, I started riding every single day, doing intervals, sprints, everything. But I haven't ride a bike, a downhill bike, easily for three years. And then I think it was two weeks before the World Champs, I, I, we got the bike. No way. The first one straight off the mall. So we said, hey, let's put extra carbon here. It was <laughs> on the heavy side, but Just to make forget sure. it. I don't want to snap it in the race or anything happens. So, you know, we're not testing. It is the first downhill bike we make and I'm going to go straight to racing. So, yeah, basically I went to, to La Molina bike park. I rode it for a day there. I, I honestly, I got comfortable straight. It was my first time riding a, a carbon downhill bike. I've never rode and everyone complained about stiffness issues. Yeah. And for me, it felt super natural. Like I, and the bike, yeah, I was like super, yeah. I matched really well with the bike. So, you know, a couple of weeks after world champs and, you know, we I got it there. That. A lot of pictures. I remember yeah, that. Everywhere. It was, Everyone's were talking yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was cool. super cool. And so that that was definitely a big big high because it was very special. Not because the race, because in the end, yeah, it's a world champion, but being honest, it's not a real world championship. Yeah. You know, it's it's a bit fake for the old guys, so we can still race and have fun. But to me it was special what was involved into it, that to, to bring the bike to yeah. to win, the fact of winning, it doesn't matter if it was the world champs or a local race, I don't care. Um, but but was that fact to go back racing with our own brand and to win with it and it was all the feeling. It was very special. My friends were there, my family was cool. there. So it was a very, very, very special, like most of the guys from the office were there. So it was really special. So, you know, all that, it puts a lot in the name of the brand, at least for me, it makes it super cool and super nice and, and, and very special. I think it's, it's the thing those, not many brands would be able to say these things in 10 years. Like, I don't know, if you go to newer bike brands, ah, yeah, I've got a couple engineers here, that, uh, we went to Asia and that's it. You never race them, you never this, or yeah, I just did one race for fun, but you know, without, yeah, I don't know, don't want to name any brand of, yeah, of the new yeah. ones, but you can imagine that yeah. those brands, it's, it's, yeah, a guy that had a vision and, and it's, it's nothing wrong with it. I'm, it's completely nothing wrong with it, but I think for me, it had to be something special, and this is very, very special. So, and that's, yeah. that's also the willing as well to, to fight more for it. Do you see a bike with an engine in the future of Uno? Ah, for sure. For sure, it, it has to come. It has to come. I'm a big fan of electric Me bikes. Too. I, I, don't, I don't have anything against Especially it. Especially if it's a cool one. Yeah. Before we finish, we have something for you. So it's an anti-stress brake. Exactly. <laughs> that we never, actually, we never thought about oh, that. It's an anti-stress brake, so huh. it's a... Uno. It's a break, but it's, it's yeah. a special Uno. Thank you so much. That's for your desk. Hope you appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, Thanks, guys. Ah, that's what you need, the Allen tool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Super cool. thank you very much for... Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us. No so, problem. Thanks for the amazing job you're doing with Uno because uh, the bike industry needs something like that, so passionate driven and so exclusive, but I would say innovative for yeah. everyone. And we're trying. All the best for the future, keep the good job and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. We're done. Cool. I was born for this. <laughs> <laughs>